two sources of knowledge that we've seen so far, our own experience, the testimony of others, but also there's a third way of access knowledge. And this third way is reason. Like, mm. For example, by the use of my reason, I can get to understand that there's necessity for something to be or to exist. And, uh, and as Thomas Aquinas says, we know the things that we don't see, the causes that we don't see by the effects that we see using our reason. Welcome back to Out of the Box podcast. We're still in I, Jose, your host, get to talk about out of the box ideas. Today, we're really excited because we actually have a really great guest here with us. Uh, his name is Paniel uh, Reyes uh, Cárdenas, and he is a doctorate uh, professor from the Oblate School of Theology, as well as teaches in, in other parts, uh, other schools as well. And so we're really excited to, to have you here with us, Paniel. Um, if you like to share a little bit with our audience, a little bit of your background and how you got your doctorate, what, what maybe you researched a little bit on during your, your doctorate. So yeah, we would really like to know a little bit more about that. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Stila and Jose, for having me in the show and podcast. I, I feel, like I said to you I, before the recording, I feel incredibly honored I'm privileged to be part of your uh, discussion, and I hope I can uh, help you con help contributing the, a little bit of thinking outside the box, <laughs> yes. uh, or even within the box, but with some coherence and rationality. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Trying to find those truths, as as you put it really well, um, that are uh, in, sometimes in front of us, but we don't always see. Mm. So um, yes, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am um, originally from Mexico. I am um, I'm, I'm from the east of Mexico, a beautiful, lovely little town called, called Orizaba. Mm. In Mexico is beautiful. Um, it's, 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 uh, we're proud to be the cleanest city in Mexico. So it's, it's one of the, of the things that we enjoy over there. It's a lovely, um, very similar to San Antonio somehow because it's, it's is a very humid place and, um, and very lavish in terms of nature. Um, so that's where I was born, but I did my studies. Of, I did a, a BTH, which is a bachelor's in theology at a Franciscan, a Franciscan Institute in Mexico City. And then after that, I did my BA in philosophy in a, in a university in Mexico City called Universidad Panamericana. Mm. And then after that, I... I <laughs> I started, you know, the search for um, where to do the postgrad studies and all that sort of stuff. And I, um, so, so I decided to go to and apply to the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom, where I did my MPhil and my PhD in philosophy. What I worked in, my, what, what I did in my uh, PhD studies um, in which in Sheffield is a, a, a really nice uh, city in the north of England, very friendly part of the country, uh, mm -hmm. lovely people, lovely beer. <laughs> and, um, and over there, I went to study under one of the most important um, specialists in philosophy about uh, the thought, uh, of course, in, in, in the UK, the best specialist in American philosopher, Charles Sanders Peirce. Um, so I was very fascinated by Peirce's ideas, but Peirce is a very kind of mysterious uh, character of the, of the 19th century, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Um, in, 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 a, in Bertrand Russell's opinion, for example, Charles Sanders Peirce is the biggest mind that the United States has given to the world. So, um, but, but, but as, as it tends to happen, he was highly, amply underrated in his own time. And, and it was after his death that he started, his, his ideas started to um, um, get a lot more attention, especially after uh, his collected papers were published by, um, by Harvard University. Um, so um, 
I studied first on the Christopher Hubwick, who, is, who was, is this professor in Sheffield. And, and one of the things that interested me was his um, approach to um, um, so his metaphysics. Now, um, uh, this question is going to come up um, in the in the podcast, for sure. For sure. But uh, one of the things I, I like to say is that I was interested into understanding um, what kind of uh, realism about universals uh, Peirce wanted to offer. And uh, so I was very excited to explore this topic. And slowly but surely, this dragged me over the, because Peirce was a mathematician as well as a philosopher and a chemist and a number of things. And he, this slowly but surely dragged me into mathematics. So my, my PhD ended up being in a, a mixture of a thesis that was partly uh, philosophy of mathematics and partly uh, metaphysics. Mm. So um, uh, metaphysics is the, is, the, is the area in philosophy that studies the structure of reality. And I was interested into understanding what kind of structures are at the bottom of this reality we live in. And surprisingly enough, many, many mathematicians and philosophers have uh, converged, they have confluence in thinking that um, the most, most advanced mathematics of today are capable, especially the area of mathematics that, that is called topology, is suitable to help us understand the dynamics of reality. Wow. So it's a, it's a, it was a topic that fascinated me. I did my PhD in thesis on, on Peirce's realism. And then I published my first book, with, uh, you know, making that thesis into a book. Um, and it's called like that, Scholastic Realism, A Key to Understanding Peirce's Philosophy. It was published in Oxford um, in the UK by Peter Lang, um, which is a Kind of well-known publishing house over there and um and then after that uh, well like you might imagine i started job hunting and i worked in different places and doing different things but uh to cut the long story short uh what i did mostly was uh, after finishing my phd in sheffield i moved to the city of nottingham also in the uk and i worked for a year as a postdoc in the university of nottingham and then after that, I worked for some time in the Burbank College, in, which is a, one of the colleges of the University of London. Uh, I did a very brief uh, time. Um, I was also going to be a postdoc in, in Trinity College in Dublin, in Ireland, because I lived in Ireland for some time. And uh, finally, <laughs> I got an offer for a, for a job in Mexico, in the, in, in the People's University of Puebla State in Puebla, Mexico, which is a tiny but very vibrant university in the city of Puebla. Um, and I've been, I've been lecturing there. Um, they, they, they wanted me most of all to be, of course, they hired me as a researcher, but they also hired me as a professor. And I've been teaching medieval philosophy and medieval theology um, over there because my 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 research on Peirce overlapped with the 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 the, the, the philosophy of one of the greatest uh, scholastics, which was the Franciscan John Duns Scotus. Wow. Sorry for the long story, but uh, I've been in UPAE for six years. Uh, but this last year, I got invited to Oblate School of Theology here in San Antonio, and I got invited to be. A visiting lecturer, and I've been teaching along with uh, Father John Mark, who's a Dominican. We've been teaching medieval theology, and I've been also teaching metaphysics as, at um, at the Mexican American Catholic College, which is associated to the University of the Incarnate Word. Um, and and my home university, my alma mater, Sheffield University, you know, as a way of kind of. Um, acknowledging um, our relationship, uh, you know, like one of his <laughs> graduated children, as it were, uh, they made me a, an honorary researcher. So I get to go, well, before pandemics, I used to get to go 
once or twice a year to do research projects over there in the UK as well. So my life is a little bit, um, you know, bouncing about, <laughs> pinballing all over the world. Uh, but uh, this year in San Antonio has been amazing for me. It, it has been one of my most uh, gratifying experiences as an academic and also as a, as a person because um, I just had the best time here. And, um, I'm just I'm just a little bit sad that it's coming to an end at the end of uh, this summer. Sorry, that was a long story. Sorry for that. <laughs> no, no, no. We we really enjoyed you know getting to to know uh, a little bit more about your background. And uh, like we said, you know, it's we're really excited to kind of dwell in, in all those topics. I know you've talked about uh, doing so many things in uh, in research, and um, and I think the the main thing that we really wanted to talk about, and the theme of this pod, podcast episode is how do we prove the existence of something metaphysical? How do we prove the existence of God, right? And how does the medical, metaphysical world uh, affect us and what does it play a part in our lives? Um, because if we can have a relationship with the metaphysical world, it means that it is there, right? And so, um, so really, uh, I think our first question would be, how does someone go about proving the existence of something metaphysical? Okay. Wow, great question. Well, um, so let me offer um, some premises to understand uh, uh, my, my response to your great question. Um, so our, our audience can kind of um, follow a little bit, um, you know, the concepts that we are going to be using, because, of course, like everything else, there's, you know, uh, if you invite a, a specialist in some topic sooner rather than later, they end up using this jargon, this, uh, mm. this uh, vocabulary that sometimes kind of doesn't help us to go through and follow up in what has been said. So I'm, I'm going to try to offer some some um, kind of preliminary definitions for us to, to be able to kind of follow the argumentation uh, in which I want to answer to your great question. So, um, Jose, you, you said something fascinating, like, uh, well, there's a number of things that, that I'd like to comment about that, but uh, first things first, one thing that is important to clarify is what's metaphysics, because maybe yeah. our audience is listening to this word and is, and they probably associate it with something spooky or something. Because mm. unfortunately, if you go to a, a popular um, a bookstore or, or, or yeah. I don't know, like, or you Google metaphysics, all sort of things gonna pop oh, up. I've seen and, that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it's, it's, it's important to clarify where the word comes from and what does it mean. So, mm -hmm. um, Metaphysics is a discipline within philosophy. And it, its its job, its business is to, to explain the structure of reality. And early on in the history of philosophy, um, the, the world actually was fruit of an accident. It, um, Aristotle was the first one who kind of formulated the the idea of this kind of discipline within philosophy, but he didn't call it metaphysics. He called it, he called it a first philosophy. And the, the, the word metaphysics was an accident. And it has to do with one of the um, scholars who studied, you know, Greek scholars who studied after Aristotle died. They were organizing his different books and everything that he left. And it was Andronicus of Rhodes. Um, Andronicus of Rhodes or, uh, or Rhodas uh, in, in Greek, who, who was a, a, comment, a commentator on Aristotle, who said, oh, well, the, we have the, the books of the physics, which Aristotle wrote, uh, and the books of the physics, um, the, they, they were a study of the end entities in movement. And then Aristotle, at the end of his life, wrote these other books, and they were placed just beyond or above, up, up above the shelf <laughs> where the, the physics were. 
So they, they, he called it, well, this, 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 these other books about the physics ones, metaphysica, <laughs> about the physics. Uh. Uh, it wasn't actually a description of the science as such. It was an accident, really. It was something that it, it had to do with an accident of how Aristotle's books of the physics were placed in one shelf and the shape shelf immediately up above had these very interesting books about the first philosophy, as Aristotle called it, Protiphilosophia in, in Greek. Um, uh, uh, and they were just above those ones. And then and then, then he called them the metaphysics, the, the, the stuff that is above <laughs> the, the books of physics. Mm -hmm. uh, but then um, this name caught up uh, in the history of philosophy. And for some reason, um, um, you know, doing what Aristotle called first philosophy uh, is equivalent to talk about, uh, is equivalent to the science that we call today metaphysics. Mm -hmm. Of course, that name, unfortunately, was abused because it's normally understood as something that is um, not as real or not as directly real as the physical world. And, and then you tend, one tends to think that is something that is... Like a conspiracy or something like that. Yeah, something that is present in reality, but not explicitly or not immediately, not evident. And, and you're right. Um, and, uh, yes, uh, a conspiracy theory is somehow a, a kind of metaphysics. But of course, there's good metaphysics and bad metaphysics. <laughs> yeah. So, um, like I said to you, metaphysics is a, a, a discipline of philosophy that helps us to understand the structure of reality. Mm. And there's many ways, many ways of describing the structures of the structure of reality. One way could be the following: there's two kinds of entities in the universe. The entities that support bad football teams, soccer teams, and the entities that support the Sheffield United, which is the best. <laughs> so that's a division of the whole universe, but it's not a very rational division of the universe. You get me? <laughs> it's not. It's not. A dif, a dif, it's not a classification of the universe that makes good sense. Aristotle came up, and I'm of course I'm cutting. All the, he, he did a very sound process of reasoning and, and thinking, well, what's our best way to approach a principle that unifies the entire realm of everything that is real? Mm. And even the things that are not real, what's common in between all the objects of the universe? And all the, you know, both live and not alive, both material and not immaterial, both uh, abstract and concrete, every Everything is unified by anything, you know, like, is there any way that we could unify the entire um, reality we live in? And he came up uh, with a great idea, I think. He came up with the idea that the unifying concept of all reality was the concept of being. Uh, so um, metaphysics is, as, uh, or first philosophy, as he called it, is the science of being, because being is a, it's a way of talking about everything that exists in reality. And it helps us to understand that structure. If we understand the structure of being, we can understand the structure of reality. So he came up with different ways of describing being. And one of the famous phrases that he's got in book four of the metaphysics, paragraph one, <laughs> I know this because I teach it over and over. Uh, it's, uh, he, he has this famous phrase, um, being is said in different modes or different ways. And uh, so Aristotle's books of the metaphysics actually are a description of modes of being. So Kiki came up from different things that all beings exhibit in their different expressions, in their different modes. And, 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 and he gave us he gave us uh, a number of distinctions that were very useful. Um, so for example, he told us that uh, every being has a formal aspect and a material aspect. Every being has a potential aspect and an active aspect. Every being has a substance 
but also has accidents and so on and so forth. And he gave us like a whole sort of theory of his first philosophy. And in the last part of the metaphysics, when he wanted to make sense that how all things hang together and how is it possible to talk of the universe as a unity, he started to think about the, necess the necessity of a being that is not like the other beings, a being that sustains reality, a, a being that has such a plenitude of being that gives uh, being to other things. And, and he called it theos in Greek, which is God in English. So, um, so even as early as the, as the books of Aristotle and metaphysics, the, the problem of God as a unifying um, being of all reality uh, already emerged. Mm. So, and I come back to the question. So if metaphysics is a structure of reality and its, its business is to describe the different modes of being, then how can we discover um, uh, an entity such as God that is not a physical entity, of course. You know, for example, I have this mug with me and I have this spray for cleaning my glasses. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, uh, but I don't, but if I want to show you the existence of God, I cannot show to the camera any object of the world that I can describe. And nonetheless, I have no doubt that its reality is, is, is not equal, but more real than this object mm. of the physical world. Uh, so your question is very, very accurate because mm. we know the reality of things not only by our sensitive experience, sense of, per sense, per sense, sense of perception, as we call it, right? Uh, we, we, only know, we not only know things by um, the reality of things, by uh, knowing them in, our, in the realm of uh, the experience that is allowed by our, our sense of perception. And so how, how is it that our mind, our human mind, um, inquires and discovers uh, beings in reality? And so you were mentioning, uh, Banyan, that uh, we keep coming back to the, to the sense that God is the unifying aspect that, in a way, shows the the reality of things right it proves the reality of things in a way and and i think it's just so interesting how how you you put it and you phrased it that it's even though it's not an object that we can see or feel with our five senses we know that it, it is more real than than um than anything physical right and so yes. how how does one go about into to putting that in their head because you know i'm putting myself in the shoes of somebody who's like maybe an atheist right and and who you know maybe doesn't have a uh, an idea of god or, or maybe does but doesn't believe in any sense of idea of god and or, so, or his evidence too or something right yeah, yeah what is that does that does that say maybe that that they can't really put into uh, words what reality is then or or what is how does how does that work like how does one go into proving maybe the that god is the unifying aspect or maybe aristotle already did that for us <laughs> well, aristotle did a good deal of work but uh, of course it's not all the work <laughs> yes mm. um well it's a great question um yeah i i i i uh, I agree with you, you know, like um, in the history of human thought, it's kind of uh, clear that um, there's no a unifying kind of opinion. Uh, there's not a unified opinion as to whether, um, whether reality has a unifying um, principle. Uh, and, and, and of course, um, uh, God's reality, God's existence, um, 
placed as one of the answers uh, to, to explain the, un the, 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 the unity of the universe and the sustaining of the universe, as you said it, um, is one of the, the ways of responding to that question, but it's obviously not self-evident. Um, and Thomas Aquinas, for example, he really uh, worried to, in, in his famous um, work, uh, this, the Summa Theologica or Summa Theologiae, mm -hmm. he uses um, a couple of his questions, um, especially question, I think it's question three of the Summa, if I remember correctly. And he says like, hold on a minute. God's reality, even if we all that, everybody who's reading this work probably believes in God, because otherwise, why would you be studying theology? <laughs> uh, um, everybody who reads this is all already believes in God, but let's think for, let's think about it for a minute. Is it self-evident that everybody believes in the same God? And he answers no. And, and, um, and that's interesting because he offers us five ways of, a, of arriving to the conclusion that there is a God. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, he wasn't the first one though. Just like you said, uh, Aristotle already um, presents us with some intuitions that will allow the subsequent tradition to elaborate some arguments about God's existence. Mm -hmm. um, and let me say something really quickly about uh, how metaphysics and our way of knowing is related to our belief in God. So uh, like you uh, both uh, commented before, like you mentioned before, that it was important um, to acknowledge that not everybody um, kind of arrives to these conclusions because people might uh, depart from a position that might be agnostic or might be athe atheist um, or, or anti-theist, right? Like what we call anti-theist, the person who is actually already quite prejudiced to the idea of any God. Mm -hmm. uh, so even, even that could be a, a, a departing stance for some people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if we don't want to worry too much about who we are talking about, we can establish some common sort of um, common um, ideas about human knowledge. And one of the things I like to um, emphasize, um, building up on what you asked before, so like how do we know if something is real, even if that thing is not kind of evident for my sense, right? Yes. So, so what do you? How do you do that? So. Um, so one of the things that Aristotle, for example, in the metaphysics says, is that the human intelligence and human mind is capable of knowing things by uh, reason. And traditional epistemology, traditional theory of knowledge tells us that the human mind can know things, know the reality of things through experience, for example, like my sense, sense of perception of this mock. But I can also know things by the testimony of others. For example, I can, um, you know, like, uh, I didn't know steel today, uh, until today, but Jose kindly to uh, told me that he had a good friend and, he, and they both, uh, you know, managed this lovely podcast. And I believe Jose, that there, there was such a person as a Steve. You know? yeah. So, so your reality was 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 achievable for to, to my mind, not yeah. because I met you in person or in the flesh, as we say, uh, but because there's a, te a a testimony I believe, which is Jose's, that you exist. <laughs> and yeah. so there's, there's two sources of knowledge that we've seen so far: our own experience the testimony of others, but also there's a third way of access knowledge. And this third way is reason. Like, mm. For example, by the use of my reason, I can get to understand that there's necessity for something to be 
or to exist. And, uh, and as Thomas Aquinas says, we know the things that we don't see, the causes that we don't see by the effects that we see using our reason. For example, if I am going driving on the motorway on the highway and I see some smoke down the road, uh, a lot of smoke, I, I, I can um, infer with the use of my reason that there's, there's fire somewhere over there. And this is, this is, um, this is uh, the, I want to build up on that third way of knowing. We said experience, testimony, but also reason. But what do we mean when we talk about reason? <laughs> when we talk about reason, what, what is it that we're talking about? And um, so reason is our capacity to know things by the use of logic. So reasoning is performing argument, logical arguments in our minds. Mm. There's different kinds of arguments and there's different kinds of logic. Um, and so, so there's at least three modes of inference that are very important in the, in the understanding of the reality of God. And, and maybe uh, we, we might get into this and I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, but you know how in philosophy, uh, God has been sometimes referred to as the eternal logos, right? Yes. And oh, if wow. we're talking about logic, and logic is, is what we use in our reasoning. And so we're reasoning almost with God in a sense. Yeah, and that's interesting because we need language in order to reason. And that's interesting how in the Bible it points to God as the logos, which is word, the word of God. The word. All that. But then also human beings are different from animals because of our language abilities, which we internalize in our brains. And then we have these arguments and conversations, as you mentioned, Peniel, in our brains, and that's what leads us to logic and reasoning. And so I think that's interesting. Yes, I think I think you are spot on, both of you, in pointing that out because um, the very fact, the sheer fact that we are reasonable, rational, reasonable and rational beings mm. tells us a lot about our place in the universe and, uh, and why are we beings that ask questions and not, mm. you know, like, um, why is it, you know, there's this many evolutionary story, this stories about the origin of man and they tend to produce reason as a byproduct of evolution, of human evolution. Mm. But I think this is a very easy um, uh, view uh, to, to criticize yeah. because, because mm. it's, it's utterly insufficient. You know, for example, if it's really the case that um, reason is only a byproduct of my survival as an animal, you know, I just had my dinner uh, two hours ago. So that would have mean that the use of my reason will, will automatically switch off because I already fulfill my organic, organic needs. Mm. <laughs> but that's not the case. I am a human being and I can have a lovely dinner, but uh, I can be anxious about questions about reality and being and existence and time and all sort of things that worry us. Mm. Uh, the, the meaning of life, for example, is something that worries a yeah. lot of uh, uh, many human beings like you and I probably. Um, so mm. yes, I totally agree with you. That the very fact that we can make these questions tells us something about um, our place in the universe. Yeah, it's and, so interesting to, to think about uh, cultures, right? Our ancestors, they also reason with these th thoughts, you know, even to the point to Aristotle, he's like, We've come so many years away from from when he existed, and so, yes. and we're still reasoning and, and still finding truths in that. And so it's almost like there's like an eternal logos, an eternal truth that yes. is you know resonating throughout history, right? And we just keep asking 
the same questions because internally we all seek that reason, right? It, and like you said, it's not just the survival. We don't just use reasoning for survival, right? And, and trying to find a prey or find work so we can find food and, you know, have food in our table. It's, you know, it, it almost expands outside of that, um, right? Uh, outside of the survival needs. Absolutely. Absolutely agree with you. It, 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 there's, there's a thirst of knowledge that is there in us and it's been universally acknowledged by, by, by most of the most advanced uh, systems of beliefs, not only philosophy, but most of the wisdoms of the different um, civilizations, they all universally agree on the desire of human beings for understanding, for knowing, for, for interacting in an intelligent way with the universe they live in. In the, we all have this need to understand where we are or why are we where we are. Yeah. Uh, so yes, and 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 if you can, I give you a, a, a fascinating example that you know, like it just it's something I like to share with you because it, when when I learned about it, it really blew my mind. Yeah. <laughs> it's something you know that it really impressed me. So there's. There's a number of different explanations of human civilization, many sociological studies, for example, based on the Mar Marxist idea that uh, culture is a, is, 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 is a byproduct, culture, religion, um, and a number of um, social dynamics are just a byproduct of the means of production. Um, um, so this story has been largely overthrown by new discoveries in archaeology. Mm. So, you know, the typical story is that human beings, they needed to, you know, fulfill their needs. And at some point they discovered how to cultivate crops and, and they became, uh, they stopped being nomads and they became sedentary. And, and then they started to have ever so more bigger communities of human beings and culture and religion kind of was a way of sort of uh, integrating those communities in peace. That's the traditional sociological story you might read in a, in a typical uh, sociology book, a history of civilization, that kind of um, approach. But uh, very recently in the, in the 1990s, a uh, German archaeologist called Klaus Schmid discovered in some part, uh, in the bordering part between um, Syria and Turkey, in uh, Asia Minor, they discovered uh, a place called Gobekli Tepe. Now, Gobekli Tepe is uh, an archaeological, uh, archaeological site that challenged every single assumption about civilization. And why did it do so? Because when they date, carbon dated the remains of these um, places, it showed that the beginning of these settlements, well, they weren't settlements because they, there was no, no seven, they were still nomads. They were still like hunters and gatherers. There was no, no agriculture by them. Um, it was from, 15,000 uh, 15, before Christ. Mm, wow. So we're talking more or less 17,000 years ago. <laughs> and it's really impressive because um, less, little did we know that the reason for these settlements wasn't because it was convenient for the for the production means, or it was inconvenient in the in, in the economical sense, financial sense. It was convenient. It was it was places that were made to to express a a need of worshiping something mm -hmm. beyond those men and women. So these are the, basically Gobekli Tepe are the first temples dedicated to something sacred beyond ourselves as human beings. Uh, and is the first expression of, of human culture. 
And what does that tell us? Well, in a nutshell, it tells us that religion is not a byproduct of, of, of the production means or, of, of, or the economical organization of a, of a community. Predated it, yeah. It predated it. The, the, que the burning question of something transcending my, myself and my perception of reality was yeah. already very, <laughs> very pungent for these people insofar as they built these huge mounds of um, he, huge uh, um, statues in, in the shape of a T and these surrounding uh, pillars uh, to them. And these are really like very sophisticated uh, pieces of construction. And you wouldn't really imagine that that existed at that early age. Um, it's, it's very impressive, and the representations, the symbols, you know, even writing, you know, we normally bring writing, the first writing um, to, to, the, to the second millennium before Christ, more or less, but not before that. Well, the Egyptians, they had high, hieroglyphs, but the writing as we know it today, kind of uh, general symbols, that express general concepts. Um, that seems to be more close to us after, after the Bronze Age. But, well, Gobekli Tepe, Tepe also trumps that. It's just, just to tell you, like it really challenged everything that was believed before its discovery. Wow. And, and it's is, it, is there this, anywhere where people can learn more about the, this place? Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's two or three good documentaries. Because there, there's a lot of stuff that is not so scientifically sort of um, presented. Sounds but there's two very serious documentaries uh, of, of Gobekli Tepe. One was, was produced by the BBC, and they normally do very good science and archaeology and history documentaries, uh, who, which presents, um, is, is, is from the 90s. <coughs> It's a part of a series of documentaries um, that the BBC produced, BBC One produces, and it's called Horizon. And so there's a chapter of Horizon about Gobekli Tepe. And, and there's another very good uh, documentary made by, um, by a famous historian yeah. um, from, from Northwestern University, I think. And, it, and the really nice thing about that, um, documentary is that it gives you the timelines of humanity, right? Of all the civilizations. And then it shows you how far back this is, this was happening. It, it really blows the mind. Yeah, um, yeah. it's, wow. it's, I find it fascinating because it really challenges all the assumptions that the presuppositions that sociologists and archeologists um, normally have about the beginning of civilization and yeah. places a, a, a growing uh, and burning question about where is the place of religious belief in, in human life? Mm. Is, is it cities where they, uh, were they created to, were they cities, human communities, were they created as a, uh, you know, because they were um, better ways of kind of interacting um, with uh, with this means of production, or is or is or, or were they other kind of needs, spiritual needs, for example, that mm. made humans uh, create civilization? Well, and I so find we, that we very can think about it. We yeah. can think about it the other way around, right? Instead of yes, like our survival it's, needs dictating the the path of our existence it's almost like the reverse our spiritual needs dictated the history and how how everything was created and even if, 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 if i'm building up on what you both said before um kind of um enticed the growing of r rational thinking mm. right right um, what that? Yeah, i I really find, for example, you know, with this um, very famous, um, you know, like uh, Richard Dawkins, for example, he's a famous atheist and he goes mm -hmm. and 
small schools and and tries to mock the beliefs of the teenagers, you know, like, and he always runs away when, when a serious contender kind of wants to debate about these kind of things. I, I myself, um, you know, I, I tend to be not um, sort of a confrontational um, uh, interlocutor. <laughs> I tend to be more like, well, let's think about this and you make your own conclusions, but uh, but of course, you know, I I want to sustain um, my own viewpoint if I think it's true. Um, so Richard Dawkins, for example, um, has this kind of a very uh, simplistic explanation of how humans create uh, created God. So that for that for him is that um, you know a, a man, a prehistoric man, so a, a lightning hitting a, a tree and the tree became um, light, light up on fire. Um, uh, so then, because he didn't understand the, uh, the, the dynamics of electricity and, and combustion, then he, cre he postulated a God to explain the natural cycle, right? Or why, why the natural cycle repeats itself in every season. Oh, well, because they didn't have a scientific explanation, then they postulated the gods or the sacred or, well, that isn't really a very reasonable explanation of the spiritual need of man because um, it, was, it was only in the context of particular explanations of <laughs> particular phenomena that men and women kind of derive natural conclusions from what they believe already. But the true, the true origin of these questions were, you know, how is it that we human beings, well, you know, imagine a prehistoric man. How, you know, like the life expectancy of those years probably was very low. So imagine that, uh, for example, you see your, your dad, you're, you're very close to your dad. Your dad dies. You know, every little infection back then could have been mortal, right? The mortal illness, um, because there was no antibi antibiotics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so a little infection could have taken us away from this world, and 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 the human beings ex experimented, for example. A man who saw his dad or his mom die feel this excruciating pain. You know, like why why this person that I love is not with me anymore? Oh. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's, we, we normally have the explanations for that. If, if 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 the origin of the religious question or the spiritual questions was a substitution for scientific explanation, if we actually know a scientific explanation for the death of somebody, that'll be the end of our interest in how the person died. But, but of course, when I, you know, I saw, unfortunately, I lost a, a few relatives fairly soon, and I know exactly what they died for. You know, I know the scientific answer, but I still un I question myself, why did they depart now? Mm not after and not before. It's not that I am asking, you know, Richard Dawkins will say, well, it's enough to know that they died of this scientific cause. Yeah, but when I ask why this, why this person is not here anymore, that's not the kind of question that I'm asking. Mm. So I'm, I'm trying to make a, 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 an analogy just to show you how ridiculous is what he says. Mm. It doesn't take care of like more of the internal feelings and, and other perspectives. Exactly. The deep, the deep expressions of our the humanity, mm. the deep desires, the deep feelings, the deep questions, yeah. they, don't the, come, they don't come as substitutes. Of yeah, that, that is similar to like, qualia, right. you know, like, like uh, we call it qualia. Like how do we explain qualia? Like the blueness of blue and, and the feeling you get when you're inspired, you know, all that stuff. And then that's another thing. And that ties in with human consciousness 
And I mean, even something as simple as perception of time and just all these things. And like, well, one of the things you said reminded me of something actually about, you know, we can know things exist without necessarily seeing them. Like we know the wind exists. We can see the wind affecting the trees, but we, we don't really like see necessarily. We don't see gravity. We know gravity exists. We know when we drop something that it falls. Of course, gravity is also a word that we created that describes a phenomenon of something falling every time you drop it. So then you get more complicated, but, <laughs> but you, but you know, like consciousness and quality of for sure, like those things. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. Absolutely agree with you. You know, like, um, this is the power of reason, you know, to, to achieve um, metaphysical knowledge. Mm. Knowledge yeah. of the stuff that is real, but not always accessible through the immediate experience, direct experience, or by testimony sometimes. Yeah, experiment. So we, we, we need to use our reason, and philosophy is in the business of trying to establish systematic reasons to understand things. And, and one of the first jobs of <laughs> metaphysics is establishing what kind of beliefs we can build up by the use of reason. So for example, well, and let me just say very quickly, just coming back to the first question actually, how can we know things that we don't see, that we don't smell? How we know they are real? but the reality is not material or not physical, you know, um, and, it's, and we still sustain that it is, is, is very much real. Um, so there's three modes of inference that they, when we said, what's reason is human use of logical thinking. But logical thinking can fall on the, on the three categories of reason. There's one that we call deductive reasoning, when we depart from premises that are established and we just derive things that are consequences of those premises that are established in a general way. Then we have um, inductive reasoning, which is a way of uh, probabilistically or statistically establish some, some, um, some occurrence of something, for example, if I want to know um, if is there, if I asked, is there poverty in San Antonio? And then I look at the statistics, how many people, for example, receive less than minimal wage or they don't have access to the necessary services. So inductively, I answer the question whether there is poverty or not in San Antonio by looking at the inductive results. And my, my answer is going to be always probabilistic is in all probability will say yes or no, according to this great statistical criteria. And there's a third way of, of using a reason that is called hypothetic or abductive reasoning. Abductive reasoning is the inference of the best explanation that will make a conclusion a matter of course. So, and, and one of the things I wanted to, 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 to explain, and I'll do it very briefly because I know that our time is running out. But these three ways of using human reason, they, they all have been used to explain the reality of God. Mm. Deductively, there's a family of arguments that explain the reality of God. And I, and you notice I haven't said as much existence of God as reality of God. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so um, there's a family of arguments that are called ontological, well, traditionally called ontological arguments that are arguments that use deduction to demonstrate the reality of God. That's the first kind of argument. There's, some arguments are inductive um, that try, try to show that the belief in God is likely to be found in a natural way, in, statistically, in the different human cultures. But the most important proofs of the existence or reality of God in the history of philosophy, 
they are abductive. They are inferences of the best explanation. Mm. And let me give you an example. Um, we talked very briefly about um, Thomas Aquinas's five ways of explaining the reality of God or the existence. And what he uses is basically a reasoning that departs from effects that we know. We use a hypothesis that connects those effects with the causes that explain those effects. So we see movement. Um, the, first, the first way says something like this. We see movement in the world and everything that is, is, is moving has the origin of that movement from another motor or something that moved it. Uh, so there has to be, in order to not fall in an infinite uh, recursive explanation of movement, there has to be a prime or a first unmoved mover. So who, who is this first unmoved, unmovable move, mover? Mm. Well, this is God. Right, the first gods. Yes, it's, it's the first, the first non-cost cause. Um, yeah, otherwise, no, you go infinite digress, is that? Yeah. Exactly. But, but infinite regress is something that um, makes sense in the abductive reason, right? You don't want ex an explanation that goes on forever. You want an explanation that gets to a, a, a final and un unlimited point and answer. Mm. So this is more or less a, a diff the family of arguments of the belief in God that we are kind of familiar in the different medieval tradition and then the modern tradition with authors such as Leibniz. And that's a family of these arguments that is very sort of prominent nowadays in different circles, philosophical circles uh, or scientific circles are abductive arguments for the reality of God. Uh, the, the arguments that they don't definitely deductively prove that God exists but they make you think that the best explanation of how things hang together is that there is a God. That makes sense now, yeah. Because a lot of the poly apologists that I listen to, they frame it like that, the best explanation, you know, rather than the latter, right? That makes sense. Yes, yes. We, we don't have amongst, amongst the, the different kinds of arguments for the reality of God. Um, only the deductive ones um, follow for by necessity that there necessarily there, is, there has to be a God. Mm. But, the, but the, the, the arguments that are more famous in the tradition and the most kind of preferred ones in the, in the, in the philosophical tradition are the abductive arguments, the hi hypothetical arguments. The ones who kind of say, well, look, I don't have a definite answer. I can't tell you exactly why, but the best explanation for this is that there is a God. Yeah, it's like a more modest argument kind of. Yes, yes. And actually, this author I was telling you about at the beginning when I was introducing my own self <laughs> to, the, to the audience, um, this um, author that I told you about, Peirce, uh, he, he has something that he calls the neglected argument for the reality of God. And this neglected argument, he calls it first the humble argument. And is it's the idea that the more you think about the hypothesis of God, the more plausible it becomes in your mind. It kind of grows on you. You see, because it's not that you're going to convince a person uh, just by a, a, a definite argument. The argument mm. has to grow um, in there. If it's a good argument, it will, like, it will have uh, consequences in, a, in future inquiry. Uh, that's it's like, why, like planting a seed, right? And then exactly. future, future experiences or discussions um continue to to water that seed exactly. right and so if it like you said if it's a good enough argument it would just plant the seed inside in in the person and it 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 almost touches on something deep within the human being because if if it's a natural longing to experience something greater than oneself right yes. then that gets them to think about the idea. But I, I think like, like a lot of people might say, you know, 
the, the fact that people don't start these conversations or don't question it's maybe due to to ignorance or or uh you know or maybe past experiences but i i think that if one starts taking the path towards hypothetically or even just debating the the idea of something beyond the physical world then we can start um um touching on maybe interesting topics right and i think it's it's uh what what stops people from from moving taking the next step to discovery is is there maybe a fear of of being wrong or or a fear of you know of yes of, of yes. believing in something that maybe doesn't exist but if we never take the the, the step uh we will never know right and so absolutely yeah that's something that actually famous american philosopher friend of hers william james used to say you know what do you prefer risking error or um you know if if you want to find a truth you might risk to be mistaken but if you never want to be mistaken you don't even dare to find or search for the truth mm, yeah makes sense actually that's true um, so I can't remember the exact name of this, but I remember something when I was wrote this book like a long time ago for several years of trying to prove the existence of God, which that statement in and of itself has certain problems because proving is a whole another kind of complicated thing. But basically the idea is um, I was diving into the creation of the universe ideas and all of that and looking at the science of it as well and start and I came across certain arguments from atheists that you know, we can say these certain things about God creating the universe. However, the fine tuning and all that, if it went even slightly differently, it doesn't matter because it would end up that way anyways. And how do we know, you know, like the universe turned out this way because that's just the way it turned out is what they say that it happened by chance. And, and maybe if it happened differently, then another universe would have been different. So it's kind of like that. They use that argument to argue against the idea that you know, this idea of God creating the universe and the fine tuning. Yeah. Yes, still. Yeah, that that's very fascinating what you just uh, mentioned because um, the, the like I kind of um, hinted before, um, there's, uh, there's a vibrancy in, in new kind of hypothetical arguments about the reality of God and, and, and the arguments um, of fine, on fine tuning and trying to understand why in this such a complex universe and the delicate balance of the universe, you know, there has to be something that uh, that allowed things to go in this in such an unlikely way as they went for make life possible. Uh, and 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 they've, they've been associated with what is called the anthropic. A principle. That's yes. Yes, uh, the anthropic mm -hmm. principle, and it's, it's let's say still that that belongs to some kind of abductive arguments, hypothetical arguments that fall under the category known as cosmological arguments. Right. So the, this, the, but some cosmological arguments like the anthropic principle and the fine tuning argument. They fall within the cosmological arguments. They fall under the category of arguments that or they they try to, to explain the reasons of why the physical world is the way that it is. There's other kind of cosmological arguments, like like um, like two of the of the ways of Thomas Aquinas, uh, or for example, the most sophisticated argument in the history of philosophy belongs for the reality of God, belongs to the Franciscan philosopher of the 14th, the 13th century, uh, John Duns Scotus. Yeah. And John Duns Scotus of, offers also a, a kind of cosmological argument based, that kind of takes elements of what Thomas Aquinas already said in the ways, but also um, um, he uses um, the idea that God is an infinite being and, and it has a mathematical element to it. So it's a kind of cosmological argument, but not really based like the, like the fine tuning argument in what you can observe, but even in the reality of how things have to be if they are at all. 
So yes, this is a, it's a world of different um, proposals and arguments, but it's, it's very interesting that um, neither Thomas Aquinas nor Thomas Scotus or no, Leibniz, for example, who, who gave us a battery of fascinating arguments for the reality of God, uh, they never said these are demonstrations for God's existence. Mm -hmm. They always said these are ways to think about how God is, how is or how God is, is the best explanation of how things are. Um, because they always kind of exploratory ways, just like Jose said, this is a seed that is grounded in some reasons. And 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 if because it's reasonable, it grows. Mm. If it wasn't reasonable, it will be overthrown by the evidence, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, so so yeah. stop right there because it's unreasonable. And so it's only through reason that we continue to create more reason. And so it's exactly. reason is the seed of further reason. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. awesome. Uh, reasons, good reasons are the reasons that are aimed to flourish in inquiry. Wow. Uh, I think that's that's uh, such a way to to leave off this this podcast. You know, I think um, our audience is is always looking to to reason, and we always invite them to continue reasoning um, in in order to reach a, a further truth, a, a bigger truth, something outside with uh, that's that's here with us. But we we just need to reason through the ideas of of the reality of it, right? So, with that said. Um, do you have any last thoughts uh, that you wanted to leave off the, the audience just, with? Well, just wanted to thank you, um, Steele and Jose. That it was it was a, such a delight to um, chat about this topic with you guys. And I'm sorry if I spoke a bit too much. I just got too excited uh, with your great questions and the opportunity to share with you. Um, and I hope, uh, you know, like, just, just, just thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this podcast. Thank you. I thought it was awesome. I learned some new things and, and I hope our audience does too. I think it's great. Yeah. Thank you for, for being on here. And, and also uh, we, we also wanted to, to help you out in, in, in spreading your, your message and also your, your teaching. And so uh, would you like to share a little bit where people sure. can find more of, of you um, and maybe your books? Uh, we will certainly drop a link down below so people can Thank further uh uh research you and, and and find your your writings thank you so much jose yes um so uh, i shared the link um that thank you for posting that um in below the, the comments or something um in the video um um and is 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 my amazon page so you can actually get the the, the printed books um through amazon and some of them are published in England, but thankfully they have good distribution so they, they can be reached out. But I also like, and I have to say, I am a big advocate for free uh, free academic uh, press. So mm -hmm. I, I really don't like when people have to pay a lot for research. Um, and and let me let me tell you, audience, it's not the researchers who benefit from that. <laughs> you know, one of my books supposedly has been a great seller, and I got a thirty pounds in oh. four years of great sellings, <laughs> wow, <laughs> which wow. is forty dollars or so, which will get me through a good dinner, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the benefit I've seen from that. But well, what I like to do is when when people you know can read. Uh, so I try to post everything I do, and it's, it's free to, to share, uh, in my academia.edu page mm. and in my research gate uh, page. I have the, you know, these kind of uh, academic social networks, and, and I try to share as much as I publish, and it's free for downloads uh, over there. Yes, great, great. So we'll, we'll I, certainly... I have a couple of, of, of works on this topic we just talked about upcoming. Uh, mm. So I'll be very happy if, if, you know, in another space on the podcast, um, we could, we, I could present them to you. Yes, yes, certainly. We, we would love to have you back on and, and share the, the new research that you, you've you developed. Um, certainly, we, we would certainly be open to that. Is that a new book that's coming up or 
new yes this is, this is a new book coming up um hopefully um in autumn is this wow. year fall this year uh, and um and there's a couple of articles as well so wow uh, a couple of articles and chapters for books on the problem of god and philosophy mm. uh, i got wow. to yeah we'll have to get, yeah. check it out well thank you very much again pania uh we really appreciate your time and um also thank you for the audience for staying on uh till the end of this podcast we really recommend uh delving into uh the work of of Daniel. he's he's a, a really passionate person who who wants to uh delve into uh and share uh the the reason and why 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 we exist why what is the reason what is the medical physical world uh have to do with our lives in everyday uh life so Um, we really thank you again, uh, Baniel, and uh, also our audience. Uh, make sure to check it out and also uh, subscribe to our channel and uh, be, be in the lookout for new videos that are going to be coming up so uh, you can stay tuned and continue to uh, look for truth and, and, and um, goodness in the world. So until next time, we will talk to you all soon. Take care. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.